horror films in the mid '90s were we're in a fallow period. You know, the the big horror franchise of the '70s and the '80s, like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, they'd started to wane at the box office. And you know, for young kids in the '90s, especially the, the mid early '90s, those the, you know Jason and Freddy and Michael just weren't really scary anymore. So the real big question for Hollywood was, you know, could there be a horror movie that could come in, reignite the genre, and once it can resonate with teen audiences? And the answer to that question was a movie called Scream. When Scream came out, it was a huge hit, but then what happened is the studio said, okay, we want our own horror movie. So for the first time, all of the major studios started producing genre movies, slasher movies. So you had, I know, the Summer and Urban Legend, which were given, you know, 10 to $15 million budgets, splashy ad campaigns. Suddenly they were shot 235. You had, um, you know, mainstream directors, writers, producers, DPs, editors, you know, composers working on these films. So suddenly the, the B movie was elevated to the A movie. You know, it's one thing to say you're a producer and then they ask you, well, what'd you produce? And if you can't, you know, list off some movies, it's hard to really say you're a producer. So I was really looking at the kinds of movies that young people wanted to go see, which were, you know, kind of about themselves, that they, were, that they could relate to in, in some way. And, and the genres that kept popping out to me were um, kind of like the high school comedy, uh, kind of a, the sex rock romp comedy, but most mostly it was horror films. I at the time was uh, working with a lot of young writers. Um, I had set up a lot of movies as a producer and I started managing a small group of writers. Nobody was really doing it at the time and um, so I had met Silvio he told me he had this idea, which was, you know, urban legends. Students are being murdered on a college campus based on urban legends. And I loved it. I just thought it was fantastic. And I said, well, let's go pitch that. My first pitch was probably an hour long, rambling. I'm all over the place. And I finish, and she looks at me, and she goes, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> at the time, when Sylvia and I started working together, his real job was he was a perfume spritzer, I think, at Nordstrom's. So we would be developing in some cafe, developing the movie, talking about all the scenes, and then he'd have to leave to go to Nordstrom's to be a perfume spritzer, which was hilarious. I mean, I think he was like 21 or 22. He was a baby. But we developed the whole thing, and then we went to go pitch it. We went around pitching to every studio in town. In that process, um, Neil Moritz had just got done doing I Know What You Did Last Summer. It was Neil's, Neil's company. Like Again, I worked for Neil and his company. I was very fortunate he hired me to work in his company. And we were a new company then, too. And he had had, had great success you know, with uh, I Know What You Did Last Summer. We went and pitched to Neil. And Neil said, oh, I love it. I'd love to do it with you guys. Let's all do it together. So we pitched it to all the studios. And no one bought it. Everyone passed. And Phoenix Pictures had just launched their studio. It was Mike Medavoy, it was brand new. And I got a call from Neil, and he said, you guys should go and pitch it to Phoenix Pictures. And I was like, who? Okay, fine, but I literally am going to Italy on vacation with my mother, who's from Naples. So that'll be our last meeting. We started the company, we meaning Arnie Messer and myself, and Jerry Schwartz, uh, who was one of the backers you know, was to do interesting films with interesting filmmakers. And I wasn't afraid to, to give somebody a chance if I thought they could do it. So, you know, you're one of those 24-year-olds who think you know everything. And I remember um, being at Phoenix and we had made a couple of more art house movies which probably hadn't made as much money as the company had hoped. And I was on this kind of kick to find a a movie which could just make money at the box office. They were, had been a company that had been making a lot of prestige movies that were critically really well uh, received. His talent relationships are crazy. I mean, he was doing movies, you know, The Mirror Has Two Faces with Robert Streisand and all these really, really highbrow, high-end, award-winning, Oscar bait kinds of movies. Some people probably think that uh, you know, I like only, um, you know, Amadeus and, and Apocalypse Now and, and, you know, instead of liking the smaller movie or anything else. I mean, as, you know, I, um, I, didn't, I don't actually see the difference. And here we come along with this little horror movie 
And I just think conceptually, he really liked it. I think he really, you know, Scream had just come out. It was massively successful. I know you did last summer. And so we were sort of riding that wave because it was really fun horror. At that point, even then, I was too old to really know what an urban legend was. I had, it had to be explained to me. Once I got it, I think I was there. We used the, went for, right for the most famous ones, whether there was the, the person hiding in the back of the car, the call is calling from inside the house, the, you know, some really disgusting ones, the dog in a microwave, the, the you know, we found some, some ones that, th anything that people could immediately go, oh, I know that. I think because they were so new, they weren't handicapped or sort of stuck in the kind of corporate studio way. So everybody was kind of new. I remember Gina and Brad and Silvio came in to pitch Urban Legend. I believe they pitched me only, but they might have pitched me and Rick Hess. I can't remember. No, they pitched me only. And I loved it and I brought it back to Rick, who loved it too. And then we took it to Mike and Mike bought it. I got the call, they made, they made an offer. They wanted to buy it. That was it, which was amazing and a true tribute to the fact that Phoenix Pictures needed movies and we got there, at, we were the right movie at the right time. I mean, it was a few drafts. It was, it was work. Um, I think the first draft that went into Phoenix, they were, you know, they, they still were very much in love with the premise, but they're like, we, you know, it needs to be better. We had a script by God, we must have had a script by October or November. It was that quick. I think it was off the second draft that they, they went ahead and greenlit it. I still remember the day it came in. I, you always, when, you're a when you work at a studio, you're always work, work, trying to work out who's gonna try and kill your project. And I, always rem I remember coming in on, that, um, on a Monday after the weekend read and writing up Mike Metavoy, my notes on why we should make this movie. And we get into the um, the weekend read meeting, which is always, was always at Phoenix at 10 a.m. on a Monday. And Mike, um, Mike brings up Urban Legend like halfway through the meeting. And he goes, I've read this script. What does everyone think? And then everyone's about to jump in and have their opinion. And Mike goes, I think we should make it. And as a young executive, it's gold. You're, you're like, you know, the boss wants to make the movie I've been championing. When the movie was green was greenlit, um, the studio wanted to bring on a, a, a writer to, to do a, a polish, which is very common. It's almost like an insurance policy that the studios have. Well, we brought so and so and paid them so and so. But it sort of becomes like it, it's kind of a comfort thing, and um, so they we ended up hiring Don Roos. I mean, Don was an experienced writer with a quote, and and I think most of the times with movies they bring in another writer to do. A, a pass. He read the script and he said, I, I don't, the script is awesome. Like the script is really good. I'm not sure you really need me. He turned in the script and he, he actually added some funny lines. He, there was some stuff that was, that was good. He respected what we were doing and he was really complimentary to the work that this little tiny baby writer had done. And that's a real, like it, that really surprised me. And also, he wrote some really funny stuff, uh, uh, some, some, some stuff that we used and that, that really elevated the movie as well. With Urban Legend, just everything went easy. There was something sort of charmed about it because it was also our first movie, all of us. It was Silvio's first movie, it was my first movie, it was Jamie Blanks, our amazing director, it was his first movie. There was a good enough place where they felt comfortable green lighting it and then starting the, the search for a director. So I started making films when I was about 13 or 14 with my friends, my brothers, my neighbours on the school holidays and we would, we would do uh, zombie films or a slasher film or whatever it was. This was in the 80s and we had a VHS camcorder and we'd have to edit the film with two VCRs and all very primitive but that's the way we could do it back then. And they became exercises in creative special effects more than storytelling. Uh, how can we kill off our friends creatively? What's the most gruesome way we can figure out how to off my younger brother? Um, but they were great in terms of teaching me the fundamentals of filmmaking, how to frame a shot, how to edit a sequence, how to use music. So once I got to film school, 
I had had a lot of practice kind of making these things and I was able to apply that to a 10 minute short film that I made as my graduating film called Silent Number. And Silent Number was about a babysitter in a thunderstorm getting these creepy phone calls from a little boy and the calls end up coming from beyond the grave. And that film kind of became my calling card once I graduated film school and it was seen by a talent scout. So I was helping set up the management division of uh, propaganda films in Hollywood and my boss at the time, Steve Golan, said, look, there's, there's quite a lot of talent down in Australia, New Zealand, isn't there? Let, let's go and have a look. So, so, so I, went, I, I set a trip, went down there, did all this uh, due diligence and ended up in Melbourne and had, had contacted the film schools and they had dropped off uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of tapes for me. This is analog days, this is video tapes, you know. So I was in the Como Hotel in Melbourne. It was raining, it was an electric storm. And I put on these short films and like after about four hours, I was about to go to sleep. I was like, oh, this is really boring, these films. And then I finally put this silent number in. And so of course, you know, I was really taken by that. And the next day I was like to the, the film school director, I, I gotta meet Jamie Blanks. Simon and I sort of started working together and he was trying to find scripts for me that I might be good for and trying to send me things from Los Angeles that I could maybe do a treatment on or try and get, you know, just have a meeting with someone. One of the scripts I sent Jamie was, I know what you did last summer. And Jamie responded, like, I, I have to shoot this movie. And I was like, well, let me try and get you in on that. So, you know, we contacted the producer, Neil, and the executives with, with Silent Number. And, you know, it just wasn't like, you know, passing, passing the bar at that point because they're starting to meet, meet filmmakers. So Jamie said, I, I'm going to shoot a trailer. I thought, well, I've got 10 minutes of 35 millimeter film stock. I could probably afford to get that processed and developed. And, and cut a little trailer together. I thought I'll just go through and find all the moments out of that script that would probably make the real trailer and I'll just shoot those bits only. So that's what I did. I went out over two weekends with some actors and some film school buddies and we shot this trailer for I Know What You Did Last Summer. I sent it in the mail, crossed my fingers and hoped for the best. When he sent it back in, it was just amazing. It was like, this is the movie. This is what it looks like raced, I think I drove it over there to, to Neil's office and dropped it off. When I was going to make I Know What You Did Last Summer, uh, we were meeting all kinds of new directors and uh, uh, we had settled on Jim Gillespie when out of the blue something arrived at my office and it was a trailer for the movie I Know What You Did Last Summer, which I just thought was absolutely terrific. And I actually remember thinking, God, did I make the wrong decision? Did I, did I just hire somebody? too early this was like this was what the movie what we wanted that movie to be and I actually saw it there on film. So he cuts a trailer for I know you did last summer with an entire Australian cast <laughs> and it was genius I mean it was genius it was like which I think they kind of copied a lot of the stuff he did when they actually made the trailer for I know you did last summer. I thought that he would be the perfect choice for this movie which he, he which he was. Once I saw that tape. For me, Jamie was really the, the lead, and after speaking to him, also I got to know he's a true horror aficionado. So that just blew me away. And um, you know, other people came in and talked about it, but we really all got behind Jamie. Some of them sent me Jamie's short film and his trailer, and um, I loved it. We met, loved his infectious personality, and then we suddenly had this script and. Immediately I thought of Jamie, and I think probably Brad called me and goes, you know Jamie Blanks? And I'm like, do you know Jamie Blanks? <laughs> and so, you know, I think there was that kind of great confluence of um, the producers and me, and then I think all, all the other executives l loving Jamie's work. I said that this is our guy, and Neil agreed, which was great, and next thing I know I'm calling Jamie up, and uh, he was mowing the lawn in Australia, and uh, next thing he was here in LA. And then we just had to persuade Mike. It was really up to me to say, you know, let's, let's back him and go for it. Mike wanted to make the movie. He was very supportive um, of the process. And then once Jamie came on board, super supportive as well. So Mike's got a storied career. He's, you know, he was Spielberg's agent. He, was, um, he made movies with Milos Forman. He had made movies with everyone you could think of, Francis Ford Coppola. And then, so Jamie's going in to meet with Mike, and I remember he was so well prepared, Jamie, for the, for the meeting, but he was just, it was literally like, it was like almost movie sweat coming off of him. And we walk in and he's, and he does this whole thing. I, th I can't remember, you have to ask Jamie. I had the support of Gina and Neil and Brad and Nick Osborne. They all sort of championed me to Mike. And uh, I think he just wanted to meet me, give me, you know, eyeball me and see if he thought I could um, pull the movie together. 
I presented him a sequence of storyboards, which was the, the boyfriend on the roof of the car, sort of took him through how I do that. And then I remember him just saying to me, okay, kid, um, don't screw it up. I think Mike was like, yeah, you can do this, like halfway, <laughs> halfway through the presentation. And so we, we suddenly had our director. It was amazing. He was interesting enough and young enough and vigorous enough that I thought, he would be, you know, he, he could direct it, and I was right. The studio, to their credit, and Neil Moritz, who is a very experienced producer, you know, certainly more experienced than me, it was my very first movie, I was a baby, um, gave us the freedom to follow our heart and to hire the guy who certainly doesn't have the resume, but he had the vision, you know, he, when we met with him, talked to him, he had such a clear vision of what he wanted to do, and he was so sure about it, that you just, you just wanted to give him the opportunity. I just remember being blown away. I mean, he's a guy who's made uh, hundreds of movies, prestige movies, and he's prepared to roll the dice on a 26-year-old kid from Australia who'd really only made some short films and a trailer. And I just couldn't believe it. I just thought, what an incredible man, what an incredible opportunity. And I just resolved to make the best movie I possibly could to reward the faith and the trust that he uh, had put in me. Jamie gave everything he had uh, to this movie, and I, you know, I think the reason the movie turned out not only creatively well but financially well was because Jamie really delivered uh, 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 strongly on that, and you know, he had a passion for it. If you can help one person, or if you can help more than one person, uh, you know, get to their dream, I mean, you, there's a reason for your life. The greatest gift that I've ever had getting to make movies is is giving people chances, you know, and I'm, I'm just, you know, I want to, I want to believe in people. I'm like, here, man, I'll defend you. I'll try and defend your vision. You stay within the parameters that we've agreed on. It's all good. So, and Jamie did that in spades and, you know, was willing to do whatever it took to make it happen. And, I'm, and uh, I, I really appreciate that. And that's, you know, that's how I wish every film experience was, to be honest. It needed to be infused with that kind of youthful exuberance that gave it an authenticity that a director who's done 20 of these never would have brought. And I think that's one of the big reasons why the movie was so, you know, successful. His passion and love of the genre, you know, he schooled me a, a few times on things, you know, he taught me a lot. And, and so it became very clear to me, there was no doubt that this was the guy to direct the movie. Everything about Jamie was so infectious, and I think that's what I loved about him. And I, I think it's his greatest quality. Is he makes everyone around him infused about the project. And I think why is it why was it easy? Because he got because he had one. He had a, I think he had a core group who was supporting him all along all along the way. And I think the second thing was because everyone fed off that enthusiasm. And so when when you have one someone that enthusiastic, you want to. Um, make it work. Neil Moritz and I used to play touch football together at Will Rogers State Park. And uh, so he knew me from that. I knew him from that. Um, I needed a job at the time. Uh, I had moved here to Malibu, had a wife and kids and a mortgage, needed a job. So read a bunch of scripts. That one came my way, went in and met Neil. And, uh, and we talked about it. And, you know, I had my conditions for, for doing the movie. He met those conditions. And, um, and we were off. I hadn't met Jamie at the time. The first time I met Michael McDonald was at Neil's office and I just liked the guy immediately and we just, we just seemed to hit it off. Our personalities gelled really well. I earned Jamie's trust really early on just by the way that we work together because you go through a lot before the first day of shooting together. You, you're really in the trenches already. And we had to hit the ground running. We had to start crewing the film and we had to start casting the movie and getting everything to shoot in a couple of months. I think this was February. We were our start date was April 20th, so we didn't have a lot of time to muck around. We had to get, we just had to go. I tried to give him as much um, reassurance and confidence as I could by, by just saying, we got this, it's gonna be fine. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna get through this and it's gonna be really good and I got your back. So we had a lot of work in front of us and I just remember Michael laying out the problems we had to solve and one by one we went through them together and solve them. And um, that can only happen if, you got, if you're in sync and you trust each other. It's just a question of resources. You've got a certain number of days, a certain number of hours, a certain number of feet of film that you have to use to tell this story. And uh, to the extent that you go over that, you're gonna hurt yourself in post-production where you're gonna need more days in ADR or whatever it might be.
that was the way it worked with Michael all throughout production and post-production. It's just a wonderful collaboration. And he's one of the best uh, creative partnerships I've had in my career. It was a, a kind of great reciprocal balance that we had between the two of us. When he really did need something else and needed more, I'd go, okay, let's, let's do that, but we know we have to take it out of here later on. And uh, Jamie reminded me that um, we ended up with, at the end of our schedule, we had a few extra days to go back, three extra days to go back and pick up really important shots at the end that we needed. And we had the full crew and, and we could go out and, uh, and, and really kind of complete the movie in those three days because we were so efficient and, um, and kind of regimented while we were shooting. Once we had Michael, we, he'd be you know, building the budget and figuring out where we're gonna shoot and then go out to the key uh, positions. I was in charge of scheduling interviews for crew members, uh, working with a casting director to, bring, you know, to, to schedule actors, schedule editors, schedule production designers, cinematographers. So I was talking with the agents, you know, helping Michael. So the first crew member we had to hire was a production designer. And I remember we met with quite a few and Charles Breen walked in the room and immediately Michael and I just kind of knew, here's our guy. And we forget about Charles Breen. I mean, his the list of credits is amazing. He worked on Blade Runner. You know, we forget that. He designed Decker's apartment. That was him. Charles Breen was an early hire because he had to go up to uh, start working on the sets that he was going to be building right away. And super sweet man. Um, really low key. Just a great creative soul. Just a great partner and I just I, I immediately liked Charles. There was a definite connection there I mean between uh, Michael and, and, and Jamie and myself and, and we had similar ideas with respect to uh, you know uh, concentrating focusing on on the sp suspense part of the the film. Not a you know cr crazy artist I, I need that blue I need that red he would just get the get the job done all the time listen very carefully to Jamie. Charles was one of the first people that was hired because he had to start work immediately they hired him and off he went. So I, I was pretty excited and, and, and I, had, I think I had worked in Toronto once before and so the idea of going up there and, and uh, the university there is just you know, lovely. I mean just really, really a beautiful, beautiful school. So it gave us you know, a production value that you wouldn't normally get on a, on a smaller film like this was. I had viewed it more as, as a suspense sort of uh, project than, than uh, you know, anything uh, you know, that was too you know, bloody or gory, or even though there's a, you know, a bit of that uh, implied in this. And I, and I thought it was interesting that Jamie wanted to do more uh, you know, implying. Every member of the entire crew deferred to Jamie because we all knew he knew more about the shots and the, and, the, and, the, and the emotion, the scare, the laugh, whatever it is, than we ever would because he knew the genre so much deeper than any of the rest of us did. I think at one point, Jamie asked me, I said, do you want to be my assistant and go to Toronto? I said, oh, let me think about that. <laughs> of course, it'd be great. And so Michael begrudgingly said, oh, all right, man, you, sure, you know, well, you can, you can have him. We interviewed quite a few DPs. And um, Jim Krasanthus' reel comes in, we look at that, and we're stunned. We were just blown away. It was so crisp and clear and sharp and intelligent, the stuff that he put together, that uh, I think both of us said, you know, let's definitely meet this guy, let's talk to him. He came in and we liked him immediately again. Funny, articulate, creative, passionate. I saw the enthusiasm of Jamie. Jamie was very, very young. I was a bit surprised by that. I, mean, I'm pretty, I was pretty young at the time, too, but he was a lot younger. There has to be some reason they gave this kid this big movie. And I, I sense I, I had a creative partner in Jamie, and I would have creative freedom and not be limited. I just wanted to work with the guy, and I, I, was, I was so hoping he was going to say yes to the job. Everything that we thought we would get from that reel was confirmed, and uh, he was on board. They saw from my low-budget TV experience, music video stuff, that I could, I could deliver the stylish, lush, contrasty footage you know, in the schedule allowed. We wanted to make a finely crafted film. We were shooting it in a wide screen aspect ratio, wanted it to sound brilliant. We got an extraordinary sound team on it later on. Thanks very much to the editor, Jay Cassidy. I had done Replacement Killers with Jay before that. As soon as I met Jay, I realized like, yeah, he's, he's my guy, we're gonna work well together. I fortunately had an editing background, so that was one area that I had quite a bit of experience in prior to having made my first film. I very quickly detected that his take on the script was not dissimilar to my own, which is the, the combination of the humor and the um, uh, suspense. We worked wonderfully in terms of telling the story out of sequence and figuring out all the pieces we needed. 
where we were in the sequence of shots, what comes before, what comes straight, straight after that. I knew, having worked with him before, that he would just take all the stress and strain out of that aspect of it. We wouldn't have to worry about that. He had, he had it locked down. Nobody was saying, oh, it's just a horror movie. We wanted to obviously make money for the studio, for everybody, but we wanted to elevate it. We didn't want it to just be another, you know, slasher movie. Both uh, Phoenix and Original just kind of sent us off to do it. It's kind of crazy to think how much freedom we had <laughs> because we all were like, what? Okay, great. We're just going to make this movie. We're going to cast this movie. We're going to go up to Toronto and shoot this movie. And they were just like, go, go, have fun, go do what you want to do, be your creative selves. It was amazing. And again, has never happened like that in my whole career. I mean, it was, it was truly charmed. I try not to get, you know, so nervous that, you know, I'm in the, in the way. I, you know, my whole thing is to watch the process as, it going, as it's going through. And if there are no hiccups or problems, uh, then I, I have hands off, really, essentially. Just let them make what they're supposed to make, right? And that, that goes back to the UA days, too. We wanted to make as good a film, craft as good a film as we possibly could. No one considered this a cheesy horror movie. They were making a movie, and they were going to do the best that they could and bring in all their talent to it, absolutely. You know, I'm trying to make good movies that people will remember. I mean, I've said, even to my son, I've said, look, when I'm gone, nobody's gonna know me or talk about it. Uh, they will talk about the films that I've been involved with, and that is where it's at. <laughs> Very proud of that. <laughs> I came in and saw some early pieces just for the opening title sequence, but, but basically when I saw the film projected at Technicolor, it was a, such a treat because it was virtually finished. It's a hard time for me to be optimistic for some strange reason, you know. There's some saying in the film business like, the movie's never as good as the dailies and never as bad as the first cut. And unfortunately, I, I think I lived my life a little bit that, that way. Um, I, you know, I was always encouraged and I thought it was looking good, but I, I, I've been through enough right now that you truly don't really know what you have until you put it in front of an audience for the first time. Within about five weeks, we, we did something, we did a, an audience preview, which is actually very fast. Uh, I mean, it's basically one pass through the movie for, for Jamie and myself, and we previewed it in front of 300 people in Pasadena, and the response was fantastic. Sorry. Any different vision of the movie uh, went away at that point because w w the direction we were going and, and the concept we had was clearly successful. Okay, listen up. This is how the story really goes. So the point from the preview to kind of locking the movie was, okay, now it isn't, oh, we have to go find the movie in here or we, or we have to retool this movie to some other movie. It, it was, oh, we have to now execute this movie more slickly. If you're doing a horror movie and no one screams during your test screening, you know you're screwed. We had so many screams, and, and also so many laughs, that we knew we had something good. This is great, watching the audience react. The opening scene was amazing, because right there I knew they were hooked, and they were going to enjoy the movie, because that, that set the tone. I still remember when the scene at the beginning, when Brad Dourif, you know, so there's someone in the back seat, the whole crowd, you just like, ah, they just scream, like, oh my god. You knew you had a great movie from that moment on. That was a real blessing, an early preview. It's a big roll of the dice, because if you get a bad score, suddenly the geniuses come in and they all know how to make your movie for you. But if you get a good score, it's all quiet on the Western front. I thought it was really good, you know. I had a feeling people would like the film. I liked it. The thing I like to take away from each movie is whatever life experience that I had, not only, you know, professional life experience, but personal life experience at the same time. And, and to me, it was just, it was a good, great, all-around experience. Seeing the whole movie for the first time was great. I mean, I had just 
Well, I hadn't seen my part either, but I knew that I was in the beginning, so I watched my part a little more, you know, critically and with more anxiety. But then with the rest of the film, um, I was able to just enjoy it, and I thought it was so good and very much of the time. For me, the premiere was super exciting. It was my first studio premiere. I was thrilled. I was working, you know, for Neil. It was for the company. Uh, you know, you go, you know, you go in, a, in a limo. You go, in a, you know, and you know, my parents went. You know, it was a, and it was fantastic. But it was so fun because going back to where it started from, a pitch from a, a young writer, a director in Australia who had done a short for another project, and then here we are at the premiere in Westwood. It was, it was unbelievable. The Urban Legend premiere was at the Westwood Village, and to have the premiere there was just magical. It was a really cool, uh, it felt old school. And, and, and th that's the great thing about this film. Even though the, the 90s genre was taking off with a horror genre, I felt that this in many ways was an old school horror movie that, was, that Jamie grew up watching, that we all grew up watching. And that's what he wanted to see. This is a movie that we all wanted to see. And he did that. The premiere of Urban Legend, I mean, th this was, this was, I mean, for me as, as, as a young manager and, and Jamie as a young filmmaker, this was, this was our breakout moment, you know, and, uh, and, and we were just, we were just living the life, you know, living the dream. And uh, I had the 68 Pontiac Bonneville convertible at the time. We were like driving around with Jamie's mum, his brother, Simone, like the whole family in this car because it could fit eight people. And we were just going around the theaters and, and, you know, standing in the back and watching the audience and, and you know, drinking beers and like just ha having a lot of fun. It was, a, it was an amazing, it was an amazing night. It's a real memory. This was the payoff of everyone's hard work. And it was a hit. It was a massive hit. Well, I saw it um, in Hollywood and I went and, and it was great. You know, it was a true Hollywood premiere and we all had a great after party. And I met, it was the first time I think I met Jared's band at the after party and we go to the door and the the d girl who alicia would let her per, later portray on entourage the development girl with her clipboard at the door did not recognize alicia or me or my fabulous wife we were all on the list she couldn't find us on the list finally after a couple of drinks in him from inside comes Blonde, albino blonde, Jared Leto, who had gone blonde at that point for, for some role, and he pushes the girl aside and he grabs me and Alicia and walks us into the party, you know. Thank you, Jared. <laughs> Jared was even opening doors for people back then. I've never been really comfortable watching myself on film, so I, I don't have a really strong memory of what my first thoughts were watching it. I, I'm sure there was a lot of like cringing and not looking at the scary stuff. And and I, I also genuinely don't enjoy watching my own work. So I probably was like, oh God, that's a lot of me up there. <laughs> I was so nervous. And I remember just sort of sinking down into my seat because I had never seen that much of myself in a movie. In retrospect, the experience of being a part of this film and having so many people over the years tell me how much they love this movie and now that I'm playing music gigs people are always coming up to me at music gigs and saying uh, how how many times they've seen Urban Legend and that it's their favorite scary movie and they watch it every Halloween and all that stuff and it's just really fun to be a part of a legacy like that and to run into people who are my age who have been watching the movie since they were the age that I was when I made the movie. It's something I, I'm really proud to have been a part of. Yeah, I thought it was the best film ever. <laughs> I thought it was a great movie and that I was going to become, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. It's just so fun to even think about all of that because it was really exciting for a lot of us. It was super exciting. You know, you're excited to go, and, and, and I had more than one scene. I was like, oh, it was that feeling. I was like, oh, this is so good. It was all of that going on. I can remember. I can remember it like that. I remember we all had a limo, and we drove from movie theater to movie theater watching it, and it was packed. Every movie was packed, and it was so exciting to, you know, that's the dream, right? 
the dream is to, to be part of a movie which, and then you're in a movie and you know that people are enjoying it. The day it came out, we, a few of us rented a, a car, a limo, to like take us out to different movie theaters and we'd go in and we'd just kind of like come in during the middle and just gauge the reaction and the theaters were full and people were, you know, jumping and screaming at the right times and laughing at the right times. I'm like, okay, this seems to be working. We drove around that night and go to theaters and stick your head in and tell the theater manager, oh, this is the director, come on oh. And they're like, oh, please come in, come in. And you stand in the back of the theater and you gauge, you know, where the laughs are, where the scares are. We just stayed for like 10 minutes at AMC or 10 minutes at, you know, uh, Trimark or wherever the fuck we were at watch, and we would watch like 10 minutes of the you know and then a couple of times I'd wait till the end and I'd walk out and i go I'm the guy I'm Parker I'm the guy with the Drano the thing in my mouth remember that the core fans have loved the movie and people that aren't core fans of the horror genre found the movie I get stopped even now all the time when people talk about hey what movies did you have you produced I mentioned urban legends people love the movie um, especially people who were coming of age at the time who were even younger than I was 20 years ago who have found the movie. People ask what picture have you done and you, must, you kind of say Urban Legend, they go, oh, Urban Legend, wow. And so it always jumps out. Actually, Urban Legend, I think, was the, had the largest profit that Phoenix made in its career. When you think about like why, why Urban Legend resonated with audiences, you know, why it became such the hit that it did, uh, I think at that time, you know, it was a real escape. There was no Netflix, no Amazon, no on-demand, no binge-watching, no Hulu, not really even internet. So people would go to the movies. It was a collected experience. They would go to have a good time to escape. I was just part of something special with all these people. Years have passed, but you all worked together, something that you were all passionate on, that you believed in, that you had fun doing. So it was, uh, I mean, it was a joy, and you always relish those moments. Well, I was very glad I did it. Uh, I was very proud of the work I did. I was proud of the collaboration, too. It's a remarkable achievement. We, we, set, we did what we set out to make a film. It's all you can hope for as, as a professional is to have, you know, a handful of memorable projects that you can, uh, you can uh, you know, be proud of. And I'm certainly proud of the work that we did on Urban Legend, that's for sure. I didn't know at the time how special it was, but looking back, it really was, and I have a lot of gratitude for that experience making that movie. That's probably why uh, Jamie was able to assemble everybody for this documentary 20 years later, is because it was, the, it was a good vibe. It was the best film I ever worked on because of the camaraderie, because it was a family, and I think uh, it was Jamie of wanting to help Jamie fulfill his lifelong dream of directing a major motion picture. And I think we all knew that and we wanted to be a part of that. Thinking back to the friendships and the way things were on set and the camaraderie and, and that's kind of what it's supposed to be, right? I mean, why do it unless it's, you're gonna have a good time doing it? We all really learned from each other. We, we got lucky, we got, we got a great cast, a great director, great producers, a great team together. And, you know, we learned to trust each other. And, and that's what I think the magic of this film was. It was, equally um, as rewarding personally as it was professionally doing that movie because we would all go to work and we worked really hard and then after we would all go to dinner and be together and like connect as human beings and that was really special. It was just a win-win. Jamie and I were always, it's funny because when you meet certain people in your life, like we hadn't seen each other for many, many years. But there was that admiration and like when I went to Australia just a couple of weeks, like a two couple months ago, um, and I, we, he's like, hey, May, I go, he's, you're gonna be in Australia? I'm like, yeah, and we, we met and we, it was like everything you, you know, we hadn't seen each other so long, but there was this like affection and like this hug and the, we had fish and chips and we had a beer and we connected and I was like, man, how do we lose touch? He, well, why, because he's on the other side of the fucking world, but um, yeah, you don't miss a beat with people you really love. I can't wait to see this new uh, remaxed Remastered, digitally remastered, Blu-ray. I want to see it on a 65-inch, you know, flat screen with the lights turned out and a cold slice of pizza. <laughs> I keep going back to that phone call to Jamie, and you know, he's a 26-year-old kid mowing his lawn, and then here we are, 20 years later, talking about a movie he directed, which, which, you know, his work allowed us to do the sequel. I really liked the movie. I liked the attitude of the movie. I liked the humor of the movie. I. I was very, very satisfied 
with what uh, Jamie had done and very ecstatic that I thought we, there was a movie that you know, we could not only make one of, but more of them. Doing the, these interviews with this group of people and, and realizing there's that much love and care and, uh, and just commitment to the craft of making movies, commitment to the director and his vision, um, it doesn't often happen like that. And so my big takeaway is that was a really special time in the life of all of us. And, uh, and it is really gratifying to hear everybody's story about how, how fondly they remember that time in their lives, especially Mr. Blanks. The fact that you're asking me the questions about what I take, you know, from this experience of having made the movie it, and you're doing something for the release, I'm, it makes me happy because, you know, Jamie and all the people who were part of it and all of the people who made some money off of it, you know, and all the people that watched the movie and have become devotees of the movie, you know, I, that, that's what makes me happy. You know, I'm proud of it. It's, you know, it's in the hundred movies that I thought that I should be proud of making. <laughs>